Yeah. So it's a it's great challenge sort of to that mm -hmm. approach. So we don't have any requirements, but uh, we're targeting different the grand challenges. Sure. So, yeah. The strategy is, you know, we are small, so we're not going to be able to work on all the engineering topics. Mm -hmm. So we select. All right, let's get started. Well, before, before we start, so there's a seminar information here, I know for the graduate students, uh, you, you guys need to check in. So this is the, this is the code. Okay, so you sign in in the, in, the, in the Moodle class or something like that. Well, you know, you know but just a reminder, the code is, is over there. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have Professor uh, Jim Chen Hong from University of Chicago visiting us uh, today. Uh, Professor Chen, well, he's going to talk about the molecular engineering of field effect transistor water sensors based on 2D nanomaterials. Yeah, sounds a very exciting topic. Professor Chen currently is a Crown Family Professor of the Prisca School of Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago and the lead water strategist and senior scientist at Argonne National Lab. He also serves as the science, lead, science leader for Argonne's uh, presence in the city of uh, Chicago. Prior coming to University of Chicago, Dr. Chen uh, served as a program direct, director for the Engineering Research Center program, the largest uh, uh, program at the NSF. Uh, um, okay, so the NSF uh, ERC program and also the, is, a, is a director of NSF I, IUCRC on, on water equipment and policy. Um, Professor Chen is well not only a great scientist, also a successful entrepreneur. Um, he has received his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Minnesota as a postdoc um, at uh, at Caltech. His current research focuses on nanomaterial innovation for sustainable energy and environment. Uh, Dr. Chen received a lot of honors. He's very prolific. He's published over two hundred eighty papers. He's a uh, highly cited research. He's also elected a fellow of National Academy of Inventors and uh, a fellow of uh, SME. All right, so let's welcome uh, Professor Chen. Good morning. I hope the micro is, microphone is on. Thank you so much, Yong, for the uh, kind introduction and also for the uh, invitation to be here. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here to speak about uh, the research I'm doing because last few times when I was here, I was a NSF program director working with the ASSIST ERC uh, that's led by Dr. Uh, Rina Misora. So uh, this is uh, really a wonderful experience for me uh, because I get to see some of the labs as well, especially your impressive additive manufacturing uh, capabilities. So uh, you, know, you mentioned about our engineering school at U Chicago. It is a fairly new engineering school. It's only uh, 12 years old, but we're a different type of engineering school. We don't have any departments. It's highly interdisciplinary, driven by three uh, technical themes, materials for sustainability, where I'm belonging to, and also immunoengineering, and then quantum science and engineering. We do have a fourth area that is sort of integration of science, technology, and art, uh, more focusing on the science communications. Uh, so let me get started with my own uh, research around the molecular engineering of field effect transistors towards water sensing applications. In my group, we're focusing on engineering nanomaterials towards different electronic device applications. Uh, a lot of them are on sensors, but some on the uh, energy devices as well. And our approach is really to uh, carry out uh, some of the foundational calculations to predict these material properties 
and then try to uh, produce them and assemble them into devices in the laboratory. So it involves a lot of you know, different uh, sort of disciplines. We feel that it's uh, very uh, interesting and also uh, uh, quite powerful to approach some of the uh, challenging uh, problems. So uh, some of the materials we have been working on over the last uh, 20 years now, uh, mostly on the hybrid nanomaterials, where we try to combine two different types of nanomaterials into a uh, sort of uh, uh, uniform structure that can offer unique performances. What you see here are some of the uh, zero-dimensional nanoparticles assembled on the surface of 1D nanomaterials or 2D nanomaterials. And these materials feature a lot of interfaces between the nanoparticles and the supporting 1D or 2D nanomaterials. And if you think about the charge transfer and accumulation and modulation of the uh, interface, you can potentially design different electronic devices. That, that's what we have been focusing on towards you know, sensing and some of the energy applications. So one example I wanted to give you before I you know, uh, dive into the water sensing is this uh, simple gas sensing platform based on the field effect transistor, but using graphene-based material as the channel material. It's a semiconductor material. Uh, in this particular case, we're using uh, reduced graphene oxide as a P-type semiconductor. And then on top of that, you have tin oxide nanocrystals, typically uh, N-type semiconductors because of the uh, oxygen vacancy during the uh, synthesis process. So you have lots of pin junctions you know, uh, on this uh, uh, surface of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the device. So these pin junctions can potentially modulate charge transfers, you know, depending on the charge transfer di direction, and that can be leveraged for different sensing applications. Right? In this particular case, when you have the interaction between the gas molecules and tin oxide nanocrystals that will initiate the charge transfer process, either from the gas molecule to the tin oxide nanocrystals or the other way around, then uh, our device will be able to perceive the uh, change in the electric characteristic. So that's how we detect these gases. So if you compare the device with the tin oxide nanocrystal versus without the tin oxide nanocrystal, you will see for different gases, you will uh, experience different type of uh, uh, change in the uh, sensitivity. With uh, NO2, for example, which is a oxidizing gas, electron acceptor, then electrons would flow from tin oxide to the uh, uh, NO2 gas molecules, right? So this charge uh, transfer is uh, encouraged because of the uh, PN junction formed at the interface, thereby you know, uh, leading to a higher or enhanced sensitivity for NO2. On the other hand, when you uh, expose this sensor to the reducing gases, such as ammonia, which is an electron uh, donor, then the charge transfer will be uh, opposite in direction, uh, which will be discouraged by the PN junctions. So that way you can really design this uh, sensor device to achieve different sensitivities towards different gases, right? That's the differential sensitivity, which is also uh, the selectivity. So that's uh, kind of, you know, the, the game we're trying to play. But today I'm going to focus on water and water sensing. Why water? Water is needed everywhere and to sustain our life as well, right? Needed for manufacturing all goods, almost. But if you look at the uh, water supply we have, we only have less than 3% of the fresh water supply on Earth. That's very limited. Out of this 3%, only a small amount is accessible. Uh, the other waters, you know, fresh water is uh, buried, you know, it's hard to access. And uh, so the demand for water is keep increasing because of the economic prosperity and you know, growing population globally, etc. Can you imagine how much water it takes to manufacture, let's say, a simple handbook, a you know, four-ounce handbook? It's 2,400 liters. You know, think about you know, the uh, water needed to produce the flour and the uh, meat, etc. right? That's a lot of water. That's why you know, we are experiencing a lot of water stress, not only here in the US, but also globally. Right? If you look at the countries you know, uh, with the uh, red color, you know, those are the highly stressed you know, countries with the water uh, uh, supply. Right? This is going to be even worse with the climate change because of the rising temperature, as you can see uh, reflected on the left uh, image here, especially on the west coast, as you could imagine. And uh, the uh, consequence of the climate change, as we have experienced, 
is frequent, you know, flooding in some places and drought in other places, right? If you look at the uh, drought index, you know, in California, those, some of the areas are really uh, dry, right? So, and while other areas, you know, are experiencing uh, flooding because of the heavy rains. So that creates a lot of, you know, uh, challenges for our communities. And you would imagine, you know, uh, well, in an area like, uh, you know, Chicago, we are by the Lake Michigan, we would be, uh, you know, water problem free, right? That's not true. You know, we had a, uh, you know, the local media, uh, Cranes Forum, had a serious articles about the challenges of water around, you know, Lake Michigan, right? You know, uh, one of the things is the flooding, you know, in our communities. And, uh, and there's also other uh, non-technical challenges, you know, cost and, you know, uh, equity, et cetera. But I'm going to showcase some of the, you know, major challenges uh, in, the, uh, in the Chicago area in terms of water challenge. Uh, lead contamination is one of them. Uh, Chicago has the longest lead service lines in the nation in terms of the water supply. So if you look at, you know, there was a report from uh, uh, Guardian just uh, last year, I think. Uh, so uh, they analyzed the data, the test data of the drinking water, the tap water in Chicago area, only 24,000 of them. And out of those uh, tested water, about 5% of the water had lead above the EPS threshold, which is 15 parts per billion. And one third of the water were tested with uh, above five parts per billion uh, lead. That's the threshold for bottled water uh, by uh, USDA. So you can tell, you know, this is a really large scale problem. And if you look at the color coding of the, uh, the local uh, geographic, you know, uh, distribution, the, the uh, dark colors shows, you know, higher concentration of lead. You know, those are corresponding to uh, uh, most of the underserved communities. So that really highlights the uh, environmental uh, injustice and uh, inequity in this area. And the other uh, major challenge is the plastics challenge, right? Every year, uh, we are dumping these uh, millions of pounds of plastics into Lake Michigan. And, it, and eventually, it's, it will be present in the water in the, in the form of uh, microplastics, you know, nanoplastics, and even uh, just in uh, 2018 alone, you know, if you look at the trashes dumped to the Lake Michigan beaches, you know, 83% of them is uh, plastics. So that creates a lot of uh, challenges for us. And more recently, you probably have, have heard of this uh, uh, forever chemicals, PFAS, uh, poly uh, or polyfluoroalkyl uh, substances. Uh, because of this uh, very strong carbon fluorine uh, uh, bond, these chemicals are not decomposing the, uh, in the environment easily. So they stay there and forever, you know, sort of. But on the other hand, if you look at, you know, the uh, PFAS in our drinking water, these are the, uh, uh, the data measured by the Environmental Working Group, right, across the nation. Uh, unfortunately, you see some of the uh, North Carolina, uh, you know, uh, cities, you know, having uh, really high concentrations of PFAS as well. And earlier this year, in March, uh, US EPA, uh, published the uh, regulatory standard for uh, PFAS. Uh, for some of the very representative PFAS, you know, P41 and PFAS, uh, the threshold is four parts per trillion. Very low concentration. Yet, if you look at the concentration, you know, Chicago is about 12. And some of the highest concentration is over, you know, 100, you know, close to 200 parts per uh, trillion. So those are really uh, major problems, you know, a lot of opportunities, you know, we need to uh, uh, address. So when I joined the U Chicago and Argon, you know, uh, we, uh, as a lead water strategist, I need to work with people across the lab to put together a strategy to uh, really highlight our uh, water research and innovation program. So I adopted this uh, three plane chart from the uh, NSF ERC program. And, uh, you know, the, there are three planes, right? You know, the top plane is the, uh, the systems integration, uh, USC has three in intelligent water systems, uh, fit for purpose water, which means, you know, you can treat the water to the right level of purity for the right type of uh, applications, water enabled energy application uh, systems, and water resource management systems, right? And we believe this uh, in this uh, coming decades, you know, this data and AI machine learning will be critical to optimize each of these systems, right? And then in order to assemble these systems, we need enabling technologies and also fundamental understanding on some of the aspects. We identify six areas of concentration. Right from materials to uh, 
selective separation to sensors, to uh, manufacturing and modeling and sustainability, uh, et cetera. So the idea is, you know, we define a system uh, level performance. We are drilled down to identify the, uh, the needed enabling technologies and then further drilling down to understand some of the scientific gap in order to assemble those uh, 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 enabling technologies and systems. So, uh, so we're focusing on you know, uh, many different aspects of this, uh, this water problem. And hopefully, you know, by leveraging the power of artificial intelligence, we'll be able to uh, accelerate the discovery and the innovation. Uh, so, but I focus on water sensors. You know, now really uh, <laughs> coming back to this water sensing. Uh, because of the importance of data, sensing is really uh, critical because that's the way you reliably collect the data to enable some of the decision making, hopefully using uh, AI or machine learning, right? So with the advancement of the AI and machine learning, now the front end sensing uh, hardware is lagging behind. So there's a lot of opportunity to uh, really look into the real time sensing capabilities to detect the different uh, uh, things in water. Not only contaminants, you know, we're talking about uh, uh, the resources as well. Uh, for example, if we wanted to recover rich, uh, nutrients from wastewater or critical minerals, you need to sense them. Anything involves, you know, precision separation or precision, uh, uh, you know, uh, agriculture, you will need to be able to measure things reliably. So, and in the water space, you have heard of many of these water catastrophes. Unfortunately, you know, Flint water crisis, you know, uh, chemical spill, etc. Right. So, if we had sensors. In the, uh, in the system to uh, real-time monitor those uh, uh, different analyzes, we would, being, uh, would have been able to at least you know, avoid some of these uh, uh, casualties you know, uh, in the first place. On the other hand, in the water industry, there's a call for digitization of water resources, which also requires you know, uh, real-time measurement of different water quality, as well as quantities as well. Talking about the quantity, you know, that's unique to our nation because of the aging infrastructure. You know, the water leak from our water supply system is <laughs> amounting to uh, trillions of gallons of uh, uh, water, uh, treated water, every year. That's a, you know, really a, a daunting you know, challenge. So uh, you could foresee there are opportunities to enable one-time testing at our home, for example, if you have a little sensor, just like glucose sensor, uh, at home to test out your water quality. That would be nice. You would be able to know whether your water is safe or not. Or even better, you know, if you could integrate these sensors to, uh, into our water systems to continuously monitor the water quality and then provide early warning capabilities, then we would, we would be able to avoid some of the uh, catastrophes, potentially. So what we're talking about is you know, the future of water system could be uh, really intelligent and that could offer the early warning capabilities to avoid this type of things. Why don't we do this, right? There must be some challenges, you know, uh, so if you look at the, the detection itself in the water, it's a pretty complicated system. It's not just H2O. There are many other components in the water. And the water chemistry can change from location to uh, location. Uh, pH will be different. And uh, there are different uh, species in the water, charged versus uh, um, uncharged. So you would be, uh, need to be able to differentiate those uh, species. And very often when we talk about contaminants, they're present at low concentration of parts per uh, million, parts per billion, parts per trillion, right? So it's very hard to uh, detect them at this low concentration. And uh, because of the multiple contaminants, you know, you need to be able to differentiate them. So that selectivity is always a major challenge. And if you wanted to detect them continuously, you need to be able to regenerate the sensor. So the uh, reversibility of the sensor can be uh, really challenging. And then, you know, stability and, you know, manufacturing. When you're trying to put a sensor into the water system, you want it to mini minimize its environmental uh, uh, impact uh, footprint as well, right? So with all those challenges, you know, uh, uh, presence, you know, we have been working uh, towards this direction using a uh, field effect transistor as a platform, but by integrating some of the uh, emerging nanomaterials such as 2D nanomaterials to address those uh, low concentration detection limit and potentially achieve the selectivity and also stability uh, as well. So uh, the idea is we have uh, 2D nanomaterials bridging the uh, source and drain electrode, right? And uh, then uh, because of the uh, electronic sensitivity of this 2D nanomaterials, we can potentially detect a very low concentration of analyze. 
And then to uh, indulge the uh, selectivity, we put gold nanoparticles on the surface of the 2D nanomaterials. Well, you can conjugate different functional uh, groups or probes on the surface of the gold nanoparticles to achieve the selectivity. So the selective binding between the analyze and the, uh, the probe can lead to the change in the uh, electrical characteristic of the device, thereby detecting different analyzes, both sensitively and selectively. Right? So this is a platform technology. Uh, in the laboratory, we have already demonstrated the capability of this platform for detection of a wide range of analyzing water, from heavy metals to bacterial to uh, nutrients such as phosphates and nitrates. And more recently, we're working on PFAS detection as well. So it is a very exciting uh, opportunity and also you know, uh, 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 you know, a lot of challenges along the way. Uh, but you know, to start with, why 2D nanomaterials, right? 2D nanomaterials is very uh, powerful, as you have learned. You know, there are many different types as well. But uh, fundamentally, if you look at its uh, specific surface to volume ratio, that's very high. That's very much needed for sensing, right? Because you need to maximize your interaction between the analyze and your sensing material. It has tunable electronic properties. By changing the thickness of the uh, 2D nanomaterials, you can achieve different electronic band gap. Or tuning the composition of the, uh, the 2D nanomaterials, you can achieve different uh, you know, electronic properties as well. And because of its uh, uh, larger lateral dimension as a 2D nanomaterial, it's easier to see them under the microscope, and it's easier to manipulate them. So in terms of the manufacturing, it's easier. And then. Uh, uh, the, these 2D nanomaterials are free of the dangling bonds so that uh, it's relatively pure on the surface. Uh, that gives us a better opportunity to uh, modulate uh, uh, the gating effect, which is uh, very often needed for this uh, sensing platform. So uh, with that in mind, you know, we look at into uh, 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 you know, all these different uh, 2D nanomaterials. Uh, they all have their pros and cons. And for example, graphene, right, it's a semi-metal. So it's not necessarily you know, the best material towards the field of factory and sister application. But it's a chemically modified form, reduced graphene oxide, for example. It can uh, be a, a amorphous semiconductor, but offers uh, some really uh, good uh, properties for uh, our sensing uh, applications. And uh, other uh, 2D nanomaterials like molybdenum disulfide, black phosphorus, or uh, maxine, they all have uh, relatively high carrier mobility and, you know, uh, on off current ratios, but their stability needs to be uh, managed in some, uh, uh, in some fashion. So we have been working a lot on uh, uh, the first, uh, you know, uh, the graphene-based materials and molybdenum disulfide and black phosphorus uh, mostly. But we uh, will dive more into the uh, BP and the reduced graphene oxide in this particular talk. So the uh, initial trial we did was, you know, trying to find a uh, simple 2D nanomaterial, uh, single element, 2D nanomaterial black phosphorus, and then uh, uh, to detect uh, uh, mercury ions to re really understand the sensing process, right? So earlier this, we tried to put together this device. It's very uh, primitive, you know, uh, basically using scotch tape to exfoliate uh, this uh, um, black phosphorus from bulk material uh, mechanically, uh, uh, as you have learned, you know, it was widely reported in the literature. So then uh, once you have those uh, nano sheets, then you would look for them, you know, under the uh, microscope and then padding electrodes on top of it. Really for fundamental research, you know, uh, it's very tedious and time consuming. But you can fabricate relatively good quality devices, as you can uh, see here. And we show that, you know, this uh, mechanically exfoliated 2D nano uh, uh, black phosphorus uh, have uh, a really good uh, crystalline uh, structure, right, evidenced by uh, uh, electron diffraction and high resolution TM imaging and the uh, Raman spectro uh, spectroscopy as well. Uh, electronically, uh, you can show uh, this is a P-type semiconductor. In vacuum, you have uh, you know fairly uh, high on-off current ratio for uh, semiconductor uh, FET devices. And if you look at the IV curve on the right, you know uh, it's mostly linear. That's suggesting the good electronic contact between the uh, metal electrodes and the uh, nano sheets. That's uh, very important for the. Uh, uh, the um, sensing applications. Uh, the stability I mentioned earlier with BP, you know, is problematic, especially in moist air, uh, as you can see from the uh, upper two uh, images. Uh, when you don't have any passivation, such as aluminum oxide, it's, uh, you know, degradation is uh, relatively fast. But in dry air, this can be, uh, you know, really minimum. You know, there's no uh, 
degradation in the uh, short amount of time. Uh, so we, we need to be mindful of this, uh, this uh, property you know, when we are doing the sensing experiments. But once we have the device, we would expose them to the uh, uh, water environment containing uh, mercury ions in this case. So we would uh, try to understand the sensing mechanism, right? So it turns out, you know, when you have really dilute mercury ion concentrations, they would absorb onto the uh, surface of the material in a, in a single, you know, uh, isolated fashion. But when you have lots of you know, these uh, uh, mercury ions, they're going to uh, uh, form a densely packed, you know, uh, uh, ions layer on top of the surface, uh, which uh, will create different effects. In the first case, uh, it will be mostly the charge transfer uh, uh, process where the electrons will be uh, uh, moving from the material to the uh, mercury ions to recombine with the positive ions, right? So that will modify the electronic properties of the uh, uh, material. In fact, with the P-type uh, black phosphorus nanosheets, it will enhance its uh, 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 conductivity because of the elevated you know, hole concentration. On the other hand, when you have a densely packed you know, mercury ion layer that's serving as a effective positive gate for a P-type semiconductor, it will lead to a reduced current, which is shown here you know, uh, on the right-hand side. So you will see different trains of the current change when you have different uh, uh, sensing mechanisms. It turns out you know, this uh, depends on the concentration as well as the divide length of the uh, uh, the electronic material, uh, black phosphorus in this case. So uh, when your uh, spacing between the uh, mercury ions is much larger than the bio lens, it will be dominated by the charge transfer that's leading to the higher or uh, increasing current in our device. And uh, in other cases, you know, when the, um, the spacing is much smaller than the bio lens, you know, uh, in the gating effect, you know, uh, it will lead to the uh, low current, reducing current. So we know, you know, there are uh, two uh, competing uh, 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 sensing mechanisms. So we, uh, we developed a uh, sort of theoretical framework to understand or predict the sensitivity of these type of devices, basically using uh, density functional theory to calculate electronic properties of these uh, BP materials, you know, uh, and then also uh, predict the absorption process using statistical thermodynamics. Then combining them together, you can uh, predict its sensitivity and you know, the change in the uh, uh, relative change in the current or resistance of the device. Uh, fundamentally, it will be linked to the uh, energy band gap or carrier mobility of the semiconductor uh, uh, material. And, you know, we did calculations of uh, BP in this case with different uh, thickness and also different uh, energy band gaps. You can see for each given nanosheets of uh, a, a particular uh, thickness, it will have two uh, different sensing processes at low concentration, you will have the uh, charge transfer process uh, as a sensing mechanism. You will see the increasing current and the positive uh, relative current change. But at higher concentration, you will have the gating effect, the, uh, the negative you know, relative change in current. And for different thicknesses, there are different trends. So when we design the sensors, we don't want to uh, design the sensor to achieve a, uh, you know, a, a effect you know, where the two uh, sensing mechanisms are canceling with each other. Right, if you uh, look at the, uh, the load detection limit, that also uh, shows uh, for some of the um, 2D nanomaterials in this case, uh, you will have the low the uh, detection limit. Uh, you will only have, you, you have two uh, vertical axes here. The left-hand side is the, uh, the load detection limit in the uh, DI water, deionized water, more <laughs> idealized water sample. And the right axis is in the real tap water where you have uh, the ionic strengths, a lot of other strengths present. So, but in any case, you will have a minimum load detection limit for given sort of energy band gap. So this is around you know, 0.5 EV-ish. Uh, so that's, that's very useful. And also when you look at the right panel, uh, the, uh, when you have the relatively uh, uh, small effective mass or the higher mobility, carrier mobility, you will have the low detection limit as well. So fundamentally, we can uh, understand you know, uh, this type of uh, properties and then try to uh, design materials to achieve that type of properties. If we compare the com computational results with the experiments, you know, the two uh, top panels are the uh, calculation uh, results, and the bottom two panels are from experiments. If you uh, look at the left two panels, basically comparing the uh, computation versus the experiments, 
and uh, you will see uh, they are qualitatively uh, uh, similar. But if you look at the, uh, the quantity in terms of the concentration uh, uh, you can detect in the, uh, the low detection limit actually is much worse in the real application, right, compared with the, uh, the computation. Well, you can detect down to 10 to the minus 15 uh, molar uh, concentration. Uh, while in the uh, experiments, we can detect to uh, 0.1 nanomolar, so that's much higher, right? So uh, the other case with the thicker uh, um, BP films uh, also. The reason being I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, because of the stability of this BP nano sheets, even during our testing process, you know, it will degrade the, uh, over, over the course of the, uh, you know, half an hour or, or one hour uh, period. But uh, nevertheless, you know, based on this computation, you can see, you know, uh, the lowest detection limit can be achieved with certain, you know, thickness of this BP sheets. Not the thinnest, not the uh, thickest, but in somewhere in between, you know, between 3 and 12 nanometers. You know, that's corresponding to an energy band gap, you know, between 0.5 and 1 eb. So that's a very uh, important information for us to really uh, try to identify best materials towards this uh, sensing process. So in our group, you know, we're trying to uh, uh, predict and identify or engineer different 2D nanomaterials uh, with this type of uh, uh, band gap and higher carrier mobility and also stability as well. So unfortunately, nature does not give us this material you know, with all these combinations of the uh, uh, good properties. So we'll have to do some uh, molecular engineering. And to achieve the selectivity, you know, uh, I mentioned earlier, you, know, uh, you need to uh, use functional groups uh, on the gold nanoparticle surfaces. In the laboratory, we have showed you know, with uh, uh, different uh, functional groups, we can target different uh, uh, analyzing water. For our lead detection, we use glutathione, which is uh, and the GSH yeah, in abbreviation. Um, and we could also use DNA zyum as a probe. For uh, mercury ion detection, we can use TGA as a probe and also uh, DNA uh, 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 pieces as the uh, probe as well. Uh, for phosphate detection, we use ferritin as the probe uh, and nitrates you know, using TEBAC. I'll show you some of the results, uh, but for bacterial detection, we use uh, the uh, antibodies of a particular strain of uh, E. coli bacteria. This is uh, 157H7, you know, pathogenic uh, uh, E. coli bacteria. You can also use more generic, you know, uh, antibodies of E. coli uh, uh, bacteria that can target, you know, 70-80% uh, of the uh, bacterial strain. So uh, one example with the lab detection where you have GSH as a probe, you can see uh, with the given pH value typically between 5 and 8 for our drinking water, uh, this GSH molecule will carry one elementary charge, you know, negative charge. And uh, based on the calculation, this uh, uh, lead ions like to bind with carboxylic group. Uh, so that's how the selectivity is, uh, is accomplished. And we have ongoing studies to understand uh, or observe how this lead ions is binding uh, with these uh, uh, molecular probes. But, you know, uh, we don't have the results here yet. And for other... Uh, target analyze, we can design probes as well to achieve the type of selectivity. So uh, we have a project, you know, in collaboration with one of our colleagues, Annie Ferguson, uh, who is a machine learning expert, trying to use uh, machine learning to help us screen a wide uh, space of molecules that can potentially uh, selectively bind with uh, uh, a particular analyte. Uh, we are, in particular, you know, with the PFAS, there are thousands of uh, compounds so uh, trying to differentiate them, you know, will be very challenging. So we have been making some good progress in that direction, trying to use machine learning to help us design those molecular probes. And we are leveraging you know, some of the argon, uh, argon's unique uh, capabilities. These are user facilities as well, the uh, uh, APS advanced photon source to really characterize the interaction between the analyte and the uh, functional probes. And uh, uh, for the uh, successful synthesis of the uh, probes, we can also leverage the argon's you know, MOVE capability, materials engineering research facility, to scale up the manufacturing of these uh, molecules. So, uh, so those are some of the uh, ongoing activities. Uh, but on the surface of the uh, device, you can also use uh, different uh, passivation layers to achieve uh, the desired you know, uh, hydrophobicity or felicity uh, in, in your applications. Very often, we would like to have uh, hydrophilic surfaces so that water can have uh, really good contact with the sensor surface to achieve the, uh, the um, uh, sensitivity. 
Uh, with those you know, learning in mind, you know, we actually you know, looking to how we can better engineer the same BP sheets to achieve better sensing performance. So we improve this uh, mechanical exfoliation process basically you know, by tracking them, you know, a simple uh, position tracking. Uh, uh, you could uh, really achieve some of the uh, you know, uh, more uniform thicknesses. It's not monodispersed, but you know, somewhere between uh, one and seven layers, you know, around three nanometers in uh, mode uh, you know, thickness. Uh, with those type of nano sheets, you can have a much higher on-off current ratio which is in indicative of the, uh, the sensing performance. And uh, with that you know, type of uh, more controlled exfoliation, we can integrate this, uh, uh, this nano sheets into a device uh, now with assisting uh, um, you know, as a problem, similar to GSH for lab detection. And you can see uh, we can detect a really wide range of concentrations from you know, a couple of parts per billion to uh, hundreds of parts per billion. But more importantly, if you look at the uh, amplified, you know, insect there, even for the low concentration, you can have uh, a quite significant select uh, sensitivity. So that is a much stronger response, you know, compared with uh, uh, the previous, you know, non-controlled, uncontrolled, you know, uh, mechanical exfoliation. And, you know, the comparison on the uh, low right panel here uh, shows the uh, uh, sensitivity, basically, for the uh, new uh, BP sheets versus the, uh, the previous BP sheets for uh, 10 parts per billion of large concentration. So that shows, you know, by understanding this platform better, and we can uh, really improve our synthesis process and to achieve better sensing uh, performance in the end. And if you compare the selectivity, uh, uh, you know, response of the uh, device to other uh, competing uh, analyze versus the LAT, which is the target, you can see uh, probably this chart um, you know, for the 20 parts per billion of lead versus anything else, you will see uh, much smaller responses for other ions. So here I wanted to point out, you know, uh, when you think about selectivity, there's, uh, there's very often, you know, it's very hard to have absolute selectivity, which means, you know, your sensor only responds to a particular analyte without any response to other things. It's very hard, especially for inorganic species, right? For bi biologic species, sometimes, you know, the antibody antigen type of interaction can be uh, more specific, but still, you know, it's not, you know, really 100%. Uh, but the idea is, you know, we need to design this differential sensitivity, which can be translated into the uh, selectivity. So that's, you know, really uh, effective, right? So this probe of cysting or GSH would be effective for lab detection. And the passivation is also important when you use this type of sensor in the water environment Right? And if the, if the quality of the aluminum oxide is not good enough, then we'll, it will complicate your response. You know, for example, when you don't have this passivation, uh, you will see your response you know, uh, is like a, a bifurcating uh, response. You know, it's hard to uh, really decide on the concentration of the analyte. Even if you use a, you know, a thin aluminum oxide, if it's not thick enough, then you will have similar type of effects. Only when it's uh, thick enough, you will have... Uh, a good monotonic response. But it cannot be too thick, you know, because uh, there's also a, a Debye lens, uh, you know, uh, limitation uh, when you have, you know, the absorption of the ions onto the sensor surface. Uh, it has to be as close as possible to your sensing channel to be able to uh, uh, detect it. Uh, so that's one example, you know, with the uh, molecular engineering of uh, black phosphorus, we can uh, enhance the sensitivity of the device, right, through molecular engineering. Now, the next example is, you know, uh, using uh, reduced graphene oxide, which is chemically modified graphene, as a sensing channel uh, for the reasons, you know, of this stability issue, you know, with the BP, right? So BP uh, is not as stable, um, but uh, even with the uh, passivation layer, you will see degradation of the sensing performance over the course of, you know, uh, a few weeks. Now, with the graphene oxide, it's, uh, it's more stable. Uh, so the idea is we need to achieve sort of monolayer graphene oxide in this case because, you know, uh, we're trying to uh, uh, modify the graphene energy band gap using the oxygen content here. By uh, using different compositions of the oxygen, you will achieve different energy band gaps. But, you know, the single layer is very important in, in this case. So the idea to achieve the single layer uh, graphene oxide deposition is we start with, you know, fairly enriched monolayer graphene oxide sheets to start with, but it's not 100%. Uh, 
Uh, we then functionalize our gold electrodes with uh, uh, sulfur groups uh, so, so that AET, basically, so uh, the one end of the AET will be binding with the gold through the uh, sulfur, uh, 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 yeah, sulfur uh, gold binding. And the other end is the amine group that can uh, interact with the hydro uh, hydroxyl group uh, in the uh, graphene oxide so that you can kind of uh, anchor the bottom layer of the graphene oxide to the electrodes. And then we use electron, uh, uh, ultrasonic wave to uh, sort of shake off the additional layers. That way you can achieve you know, exclusively monolayer graphene oxide based devices. And we have been doing this you know, for a, a few years actually you know, uh, through a lot of learning. You can uh, assemble this fairly irregular graphene oxide sheets onto the surface of the, uh, uh, the electrodes uh, relatively uh, uniformly. When we say uniform, it is random distribution. right? And also we can uh, really assemble uh, gold nanoparticles on the top surface you know, quite uniformly as well. And we can predict you know, uh, how much graphene oxide that is needed right? based on the procreation uh, theory. You know, we can predict the concentration we need to use and then uh, you, know, um, you, you don't waste too much materials. Right? And uh, as long as we achieve the uh, percolation uh, threshold, we would be able to uh, uh, produce an effective device. After that, we also need to uh, reduce the graphene oxide. That's when we are tuning the energy band gap of this amorphous semiconductor. So for reduced graphene oxide, uh, carbon is ordered, oxygen is not, right? So it's amorphous uh, semiconductor, but it has an effective uh, energy band gap, right? So during this uh, reduction process using a thermal approach, for example, you get rid of the, most of the uh, oxygen groups, but you can control it. You know, by controlling the composition of oxygen, you can achieve different uh, energy band gap of this uh, reduced graphene oxide. And we show that we can achieve fairly uh, uniform distributions of this uh, graphene oxide sheets, monolayer structure based on the AFM uh, imaging. And we, we know they are graphene because you know, the uh, Raman uh, spectrum shows the uh, characteristic you know, peaks, D peaks and G peaks, as you all know. And the uh, P-type semiconducting uh, property as well, and good linear, you know, uh, electrode uh, uh, graphene contact, you know, showing by the linear uh, IV curve as well. So with that, you know, type of device, uh, we can uh, fabricate sensors to detect a different analyze by using different uh, functional probes. As you can see here, from lead to uh, ferrite uh, to uh, phosphate to uh, mercury and bacteria. A few observations. Here, right? So uh, first, you know, when you introduce analyze onto this sensor device, you see the response right away uh, on a matter of you know seconds, right? That's the real time sensing. And uh, secondly, you can detect it down to very low concentrations. You know, for large, you know, a few parts per billion, well below the uh, 15 parts per billion uh, threshold, or five parts per billion the uh, bottled water uh, standard. Uh, for uh, phosphate, we can detect down to uh, uh, tens of nanomolo, that's about a few parts per billion uh, concentration. Mercury as well, two parts per billion. And for bacteria, that's uh, relatively uh, unique because uh, the current technology to measure bacteria takes you know, hours, you know, uh, at least, you know, to um, basically optically counting the uh, bacteria after culturing, uh, especially at low concentrations. So this one gives you, you know, really uh, immediate response uh, down to you know, uh, 10 CFU uh, uh, colony forming units per uh, milliliter. So this is uh, you know quite exciting because now we can read bacteria counts you know uh, right away uh, at fairly low concentration. But it's not low enough for drinking water applications. The drinking water standard says you cannot have more than one bacteria in hundred milliliter concentration. But nevertheless, you know this detection limit can be useful for beach you know uh, water quality screening or uh, swimming pool you know uh, water quality testing, etc. So. So the point is, you know, this type of platform is quite uh, uh, versatile you, because you can uh, use a different probe to target different, uh, you know, analyte. And for nitrate, you know, uh, uh, that's also, you know, uh, similarly, uh, uh, I use this uh, as a, you know, a special example because I wanted to show you the reusability of this type of device. So in this case, we use TBSC as the probe, one end of the TBSC uh, forming the pi pi interaction with the graphene surface and the other end is uh, triacylamine that can uh, interact with the uh, nitrates uh, so that we can detect them more uh, selectively. 
And it, again, we can detect it down to you know very low concentrations of uh, 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 nitrates, you know, uh, on the order of one part per uh, billion, and uh, um, and also uh, it's an instantaneous response as well, right? So uh, so we try to uh, test out whether this type of sensor can be reused, right? So uh, after you use this once, you would uh, think you know this analyze would already stick onto the surface of the sensor. And then for the next detection, you will need to be able to accommodate additional uh, capacity for the absorption, or you have to regenerate them, right? So we tested this uh, device, you know, a few times. You can see, uh, you know, just after a few uh, uh, testing, you will see the performance uh, significantly degrades, so that there's no additional capacity. Uh, you will uh, see any uh, any uh, you know significant response per se. But if you regenerate this sensor uh, in a in a let's say um, a saturated uh, sodium chloride solution, you would be able to restore some of the uh, the probes so that you can retest the reuse this sensor device. You know, uh, you know, essentially with similar type of uh, sensitivity. So this uh, shows this type of sensor can be regenerated. Uh, but ideally, if you could design the molecular probe so that uh, you can achieve a reversible binding process, you know that can be driven by concentration gradient. That would be great, so that you can you know, uh, really detect the fluctuation of the analyze in the flowing water you know, uh, continuously. Now, that's something you know, we are working on right now. And the other beauty of this uh, sensing platform is you can multiplex them uh, to detect different things simultaneously. So for example, if you, uh, you know, this shows an array of three devices. You know, uh, one is designed to target lead ions, the second is designed to target mercury ions, the third one is targeting uh, bacteria. Putting them together, it's a device with three uh, chips that can simultaneously detect the three uh, different analyzes. And it sh you see some of the cross interactions, you know, uh, as I mentioned earlier, because you don't have the absolute you know, selectivity. But you know, based on this, uh, you know, uh, significantly enhanced response for giving analyze, you would be able to derive the concentration of each uh, based on some of the uh, um, algorithms. So uh, one of the major challenge in this type of device fabrication, and it, potentially in many of the nano device fabrication, is the device uniformity, which means in the laboratory you can make you know, 10, 20 devices, they're all performing, you, know, you can report this you know, results with the arrow bar, Right in a, in a scientific journal. In reality, when you are trying to produce a product, you have to make these devices you know, almost all the same. You cannot have too much of the variation because if you have too, too, too large variation, you will not be able to come up with a single calibration that can work for all, right? Which means you have to calibrate them individually, which will be almost impossible. So one of the directions we are trying to pursue is first to uh, reduce the manufacturing variability to start with. Then you also can use more enhanced calibration approaches to come up with a better prediction. So we're leveraging machine learning models you know, that can potentially take into account the history of the manufacturing process for each individual devices so that, uh, you know, batch process typically, uh, so that you can better uh, predict the concentration of the analyte based on your uh, individual device and also their, uh, uh, their shield responses. And we, you know, uh, Young mentioned, you know, uh, I'm a successful entrepreneur. I cannot say successful, but you know, I'm a you know, learning entrepreneur for sure. You know, uh, I started a company to commercialize this graphene-based field effect transistor uh, uh, technology. And we are leveraging, you know, NSA funding, National Science Foundation funding, for, uh, for evolution of this technology readiness level, you know, from one initial idea all the way to uh, commercialization. We are now in this stage of refining the manufacturing protocol to really launch the product. But you see some of the beta products there. It's a handheld device that allows you to test lead in your tap water uh, through a uh, app in the, uh, in the uh, phone, smartphone, right? So it's very easy to use and it gives you the results in a few minutes. It reads the digital concentration of lead and will give you the guidance what to do, right? So, uh, so that's coming up, you know, uh, hopefully in the near future. But this same 
platform technology can be engineered towards detection of other things I mentioned, you know, PFAS, you know, bacterial and nutrients, etc. Uh, so some of the recent results, for example, uh, we really try to be able to control the manufacturing process. And in fact, this is the uh, research towards screening high quality devices versus you know, poor quality devices based on just their electronic properties alone. Uh, it's, it's not sufficient. You know, basically, if we look at their on and off current ratio or their uh, uh, resistance, it's not enough. They may be the same, you know, very close to each other, but their sensing performance may be very different. It turns out the quality of that uh, aluminum oxide passivation can be very important. If you have some pores or porosities in it, it will modify your sensing performance, especially in the water environment. So we have detect, uh, developed a uh, uh, non-destructive you know, approach using the uh, impedance spectroscopy to identify good ones from, from the bad ones. So uh, it's, it's a major uh, improvement towards the manufacturing process. So with these real-time sensors, I wanted to show you a couple of uh, you know, quick applications. You know, uh, one of the projects we had was uh, funded by the DOE uh, EIE, uh, really to look at how we can better recover nutrients from municipal wastewater, you know, phosphates and nitrates. So sensor can be important, I mentioned earlier. When you try to precisionly separate things from water, you need to sense them and to be able to control them, right? So, uh, so our sensor is contributing to this particular process by uh, providing real-time measurements of phosphates and nitrates concentration, and then my collaborators would use this data to optimize the, uh, the process overall, then control different parameters to achieve the best outcome for the nutrient recovery. And finally, you know, we are also mindful of manufacturing process of this type of sensors. How can we minimize the environmental footprint, right? So this is a future manufacturing project, you know, uh, we have been working on. I know uh, uh, Dr. Yung Zhang also has a future manufacturing project. Uh, but in this case, we're trying to use components derived from plants to print this type of field effect transistors and uh, field effect transistor sensors and the lithium ion batteries so that we can use the battery powered sensor to monitor the growth conditions of the plants, typically uh, in water or aeroponic systems, so that you, cr uh, you close the loop to uh, produce a circular manufacturing sort of process. Uh, but we are also involving AI machine learning to optimize each of the components and the overall manufacturing process. And then you know, it's also guided by life cycle assessment and techno-economic analysis to really ensure the entire process is cost-effective and environmentally friendly in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, materials use, water use, etc. So that the sensors we are producing are hopefully mostly biodegradable, not damaging the environment too much, or recyclable for battery, you know, especially some of the metal components that can be recycled. Everything else can be uh, uh, biodegradable. So that's the whole idea. Uh, um, so hopefully, you know, we can uh, also uh, address the manufacturing uh, uh, environmental sustainability as well. So to summarize, you know, basically I showed you, uh, you know, there's a great opportunity to really uh, uh, engineer this type of sensors towards uh, intelligent water systems and this field effect transistor-based platform uh, by leveraging the 2D nanomaterials can really enable high sensing uh, performance uh, that can uh, uh, contribute to that uh, uh, vision. Uh, and also the sensing performance can be uh, molecularly engineered, right? So uh, uh, in terms of the channel material, in terms of the functional groups, in terms of the passivation layers, uh, et cetera. So uh, that's, that's the message I can uh, uh, tell you at this point. So uh, I, want, I wanted to thank our collaborators, a lot of them, you know, over the years, and the funding source from uh, National Science Foundation, DOE, and uh, many other uh, funding agencies as well. So with that, I would like to uh, stop here and uh, thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions you might have. It's a fabulous talk. Um, open the floor for questions. So, uh, you had either uh, lead or mercury or some other uh, ions in your uh, water uh, that you are trying to detect, right? Suppose I, I have only deionized water. I want to see how much uh, charge it can transfer to another uh, material. Can I measure it with the graphene sensor that you have? Charge? Yes. 
in the deionized water, you would have uh, really a minimum amount of uh, ions, right? But they could be, you know, uh, yeah, we can detect pH, you know, which is, you know, based on the proton uh, charge, right? So that can be done uh, if that's what you mean. I think it's, it's possible. Measure yeah, measure pH. Yeah, so keep in mind, so for the FET platform, we have to measure charges, right? That's, that's the principle. We measure charged species on the surface of the device that can modify the uh, conductivity of the uh, channel material. So, yeah, if, if there's any charge you wanted to measure, for example, pH value, right? That's the proton concentration. That can be uh, measured. Yeah, not for the flow. Not for the flow. Or you can design something, you know, uh, creatively, you know, to measure the flow. And that can be uh, another aspect. Okay. So, what is the operational limit of the transistor? Uh, operational limit in terms of. Uh, okay. Yeah. You know, frankly, we have not really tested. Uh, all these uh, environmental parameters very systematically. But obviously, you know, when you have a uh, change in temperature, that might impact the performance of the device, you know, slightly, I would say, of, you know, as long as it's the environmental sort of temperature variation. Um, Pressure-wise, we have not really done any testing yet. So that could be uh, something uh, for future work. Yeah. So we use uh yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, so it is possible. So uh, when you design this sensor, so on, on the surface of the aluminum oxide, we put down the gold nanoparticles, right? And gold nanoparticles are conjugated with different uh, probes. So when the uh, particles are far apart, you will expose a lot of aluminum oxide surface to the analyte, which might modify your sensing response as well. But if you uh, make these nanoparticles closer to each other, then you would minimize that exposure, which will mitigate this type of effect. I, I, I would say there will be some, but you know, uh, if you do this correctly, you will be able to minimize those, uh, those interactions directly between the aluminum oxide passivation and the uh, analyte. Yeah, and that can be sometimes you know, uh, going quite annoying, right? So if you don't do this correctly, you know, uh, aluminum oxide especially, when uh, at this uh, small thickness, the quality can be uh, Hard to know, you know. It's hard to uh, to find out any defects or porosity there. That's why we developed that uh, new technology to screen the device. So yes, so you have to design this, you know, uh, very carefully. So the aluminum oxide will cover the two D nanomaterial, but also will cover kind of like the gold nanoparticles. Gold nanoparticles will be on top of the aluminum oxide, right. but it will cover the gold electrodes as well. I see. Yeah, cover everything. I can have a question. Just yeah. <laughs> okay, go so ahead. Can you explain the slide on which we showed the PC and the machine learning part of it? How are you using uh, it to exactly reduce the manufacturing variance? Yeah, so uh, you basically, you know, you can introduce more variables now. The power of machine learning is it can handle high dimensions of the variables, right? So in the past, when we do the calibration, it's really comparing the signal from the device let's say current change or resistance change versus the concentration, right? It's really one-to-one -one most often. Now, by using machine learning, now you can uh, take into account this device characteristics, let's say on-off current ratio, its resistance, or many other dimensions you think that could be impacting your uh, signal. So now the signal is not just one signal, but also other parameters that are contributing to the signals, right? So that way you can have a better 
sort of uh, corresponding relationship you can uh, map out. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So, for time, let me ask the last question. Um, so, for for the, for the two D materials, right? So, how did you manufacture two D materials? Do you use grow the two D materials on the substrate, or use some sort of transfer? Yeah. Printing? So uh, nowadays, we typically just purchase the commercial materials because for okay. graphene, graphene oxide, or molybdenum disulfide, yeah. or BP, you know, they are commercially available. But also. Uh, you know, we are collaborating with uh, Mark Hosam's group from Northwestern, so they are producing all kinds of uh, 2D nanotubular inks that can allow us to either assemble or print so them. So those are printed, right? With inks, those will be, yeah. be printed. Yeah, with ink, we'll be printing. But for non-ink, you know, uh, it's really commercial dispositions of those 2D nanotubules mm -hmm. we're using. But, I mean, how about the size? Is it, is, it, is it a large size or it's flex? Yeah, it depends. So so our uh, electric gap typically is on the order of micrometers, you know, a few micrometers. So your lateral size, you know, should be on that order of magnitude or larger. Right. But yeah. I mean, if you have a discrete flex, right, how do you know how to locate where exactly the flex are? Do you yeah. need to do this e beam lithography to do that? We don't. You know, so initially, when we fabricate those trial devices, BP uh, mm -hmm. nanosheets, we really look at individual sheets and then pattern on top of the uh, sheet to uh, make the device. But now for the uh, for the larger scale manufacturing, we just care about the random assembly of the 2D nano, nano materials on the surface of the electrode, already patterned electrodes, into digital electrodes, but okay. achieving okay. the percolation threshold. Okay. okay. Right. So so that you see the conductivity there. So you just distribute randomly on top yes. of the. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. The key is randomly. Okay. You cannot, you know, pile them up in one place and then there's nothing there <laughs> anywhere else. Okay. Then it doesn't work, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I see. Yeah. Got you. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for coming uh, to the seminar. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't ask before because hey. I have a feeling most people here don't care. What's the actual mechanism for sensing the bacteria? Like, I understand intrinsically, you know, so, you have dissolved metals. Yeah, yeah. That, that's easy to understand. Are you looking so for a metabolite? So we think it's the charges carried by the surface of the uh, bacteria. Uh, the cell yeah, right. membrane yeah. Kind of the yeah. bacteria. The so pathogen as well, similar. They all have, you know, some kind of surface charges. Yeah. That's what we detect for photofactoring system. I was wondering if, it, because you had mentioned pH, I was wondering if it was the metabolic acids that they excrete that you were detecting. No, nope, no. But, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, surface charges on the membrane. Okay, yeah, that makes yeah. Sense. maybe there could be mechanisms that can uh, leverage this. Uh, Large, yeah. yeah. Type of activity. At that point, you're probably better off just culturing them anyway, so yeah. if you need that much right. metabolite. Yeah, I think what we're trying to gain here is really the speed. How yeah. can you get this concentration, you know, faster? Yeah, and, you know, of course, there's there's a use to that a level of immediacy uh, that you can't get from culturing, of course. Yeah, so, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, like, we need to turn off the, the water supply now. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. Well, Are you, you a biologist or...? Uh, I was a BME major, now I'm a mechanical engineer. Okay. So yeah. that's BME, oh, yeah. so there's a uh, connectivity to your biology. So that's yeah, uh, I'm finding, so I had a couple of years in, in the workforce doing something unrelated. I'm finding a pleasant change in mechanical engineers' interest in understanding of biological things yeah, yeah. during that gap. Right. Um, but, you know, I'm here to do mechanical, more mechanical, mechanical things. Sure. Than I was trained as a mechanical engineer as well. So, yeah. I mean, mechanical can be really broad, right? You know, there are different yeah. kind of, uh, pockets of the mechanical engineer. And I mean, name a device nowadays that has one dimension of engineering to it. Like, it, that doesn't hurt. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, the, the more varied your skill set, of course, you can always do it. Very good. Yeah. Sorry. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, actually, I wanted to understand how uh, to exactly you are using this machine learning to do the relations with manufacturing variants. Because we can uh, kind of go, uh, reduce all this me method for different companies as well, not specific to your. Yeah. So, I wanted to ask, how are you doing that? 
Yeah, I mean, the details of the machine learning are less, uh, you know, my, what my uh, postdoc is doing. So I, um, I really think about, you know, the high level strategy, you know. But the idea is now, you know, compared with the traditional calibration where you only consider a very small uh, number of conditions, very uh, often it's one. Right? Now you can expand it to uh, many parameters. Essentially, you need to produce a lot of data sets with different conditions okay. and then different uh, signals and, uh, you know, uh, corresponding to standard kernel equation. You try to map out with some multiple parameter to one application, right? So that's what machine learning is doing a lot. So you can choose different machine learning algorithms, which is part of the research, right? Or you can improve a particular machine learning algorithm <laughs> to achieve this type of prediction. Because, you know, we are not going to have a huge amount of data compared to these medical fields, right? So, so that's, yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, I couldn't give you the specific you know, like, machine learning sort of... Uh, <laughs> I was just looking into how can we uh, pro, uh, use if I want to make a company which provides solution of machine learning to other fields. Yeah, yeah. So how can I do that? I just wanted to understand how you are using Generalize. Uh, not all... Um, there is a problem of manufacturing variance everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So that, uh, you can tackle that. Yeah, sure. yeah, that's certainly a very uh, important direction to tackle. Yeah. 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 Are you working on machine learning? Uh, yeah, so actually I just converted into a PhD. I completed my master, I converted into a PhD. Okay. My PhD is in combustion, thermal science, and other things. And yeah, I have to use machine learning to uh, in application to uh, find the speed up the simulations, yeah. or find the reason why this instability of, uh, that's exciting. Yeah, yeah, that's you know, yeah. machine learning can be really <laughs> powerful. Yeah. Right? When you deal with very yeah. complex yeah. processes, yeah. Uh, that's an advantage. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I was doing it. was nice. So you made a company out of it? Yeah, yeah. Well, we have a company, you know, Nano you know, you can look it up. Yes. Oh, okay. So I'll look it up. I'll just note your company's name. N-A-N-O A-F-F-I-X. Just a second. Yeah. N A N U A F F I X. Yeah, you should be able to Google it. Yeah, got it. Right? Yeah. Well, when you have a have a successful company, you know, let me know. I'm sure that your machine learning will be uh, very powerful. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Yeah, you're welcome. Bye bye. <笑>你会喜欢你会喜欢对对中国歌我们一起去中国对中国你一起去中国对中国你一起去中国对中国你一起去中国对中国你一起去中国对中国你一起去中国对中国你一起去中国对中国你一起去中国对中国你一起去中